1997 is the last year in this series covering DOS games. And while it's not the biggest of DOS years in terms of sheer amount of games released, it's definitely a noteworthy one. Both in terms of games that came out and what happened in the world. In June, Wi-Fi standard was introduced for the first time and while at the time it seemed groundbreaking, no one expected how important it would eventually become in our day-to-day -day lives just a couple of decades later. Steve Jobs returned to Apple to save it on September 16th, whether Apple itself wanted to admit it or not. And he did. IBM's Deep Blue computer finally defeated world champion chess player Garry Kasparov, winning in only 62 minutes. And it was probably the first time we realized that even if largely limited by how they're designed, computers were far more capable than our brains are when applied to heavily customized to a specific set of requirements tasks. Mars Pathfinder landed on the Red Planet and the first pictures from the surface were shown in real time on NASA's website. A GP port for much faster graphics cards was introduced by Intel and Microsoft released DirectX 5.0 cementing Windows' gaming superiority over DOS forever. Sergey Brin and Larry Page registered Google.com domain and changed the world whether they knew it or not. Also, in 1997, Bill Gates became the world's richest man and while ever since then he swapped the position with other technological magnates, he never fell off the top 10. Intel introduced Pentium 2 processor, the fastest CPU at the time of its release, and Ultima Online, one of the first ever MMORPGs, was released on Windows, allowing for thousands of players to experience its wonderful world together. But as much as it's all interesting, you came here to see what released for DOS during 1997. And since there were quite a few good games, let's not waste any more time and just get into it. Action Supercross is a precursor, an earlier version, or better even, to the later Elastomania. But if you put them side to side, there's no difference. At least I can't tell any. Maybe it's the levels number, maybe it's something else, I don't know. But what I do know, that it's super fun. In essence, it's a side-scrolling trial bike obstacle course that uses semi-realistic physics in entirely unrealistic environments. They're so over the top that creating any of this in reality is borderline impossible. I mean, we could in theory sort of have all those ledges attached on one side to the wall, make them extra wide, but... But what am I even talking about? It's a game, and henceforth uses game logic. And game logic allows for anything game designers' imagination can spawn. So, Action Supercross is that precisely. Super and full of action. On a cross bike. Each of the 47 levels is more convoluted than the previous one, and some of the latter ones seem like little puzzles to figure out before even attempting to complete them in the right way. Some may require you hanging by one wheel on certain ledges, other may seek for daredevil worthy acrobatics or even smart planning of the order in which each part of the level should be completed. All because it's not a racer. You're on a stunt course and have to collect all apples. But while it sounds simple, it's anything but. I've wasted weeks in Elastomania competing against a friend who sadly by now passed away. But that memory of us trying to figure out the levels and then beat each other's times is what I'm left with. And that's good enough, given the circumstances. It's a brilliant little game and those who never played it should give it a go as it's much more fun than it looks. Amulets and Armor is an interesting title because it went through the development hell. It took way longer than it should have and because of that it missed its window to shine. In a time when most games took months to a year to complete, Amulets and Armor needed over two. And when it released eventually, it wasn't technologically superior in any way to what was on the market already. But it doesn't make it a bad game in any way, shape or form. It's actually excellent, looking similarly 2.5D engine-wise to Bethesda's Daggerfall and sporting pretty nice, if a bit pixelated, VGA graphics. It may not be as big as Daggerfall, but it's not randomized and all of its content is carefully curated. You have to defeat the evil necromancer who's deep in the catacombs of castle areas. Come to think of it, are there any good necromancers? And if there are, what do they do? Do they raise skeletons to polish their bones to shine? Or zombies to help them with bad B.O.? Or perhaps communicate with the dead to learn their last wishes? And if that's the case, are mediums who claim that they can talk to the dead necromancers too? That's a tough one. Anyway, Amulets and Armor offers a large campaign spread over 30 levels, features 3 different magic schools and 11 character classes. And it all sounds fun and all, and trust me, it's a good game. You may wonder about something else. I did say that it was excellent after all, and so far it just sounds like any other real-time dungeon crawling RPG of the time. Well, Amulets and Armor offers a very innovative and basically unseen in a genre cooperative multiplayer for up to 4 players via IPX or modem to complete the adventures and dungeons together forming a real party. Sounds cool, doesn't it? It is. But what this game also is, is probably the best example of an obscure title that I ever spoke of. 
In its initial release as Sharer in 1997, it sold less than 100 copies. Yeah, you heard it right. 100. And it only ever gained a fraction of popularity and recognition it deserved years later when it was shared by all the modern abandonware sites. Assault Trooper is an isometric shooter with tactical and stealth elements. Kinda like my cat, who while not a trooper, is definitely a assault unit who mastered both stealth and tactics. I mean, no one ever could hide as well in a disposable shopping bag as he can. But coming back to our game, you're a special forces trooper sent on series of missions. That are actually quite varied and can be rescue operations, document retrieval, destruction of military targets, sabotage or even assassinations. That last one is also something that my cat performs whenever he spots a rogue mosquito or a fly at home. Before each mission you have to select equipment you'll take on it, keeping in mind that there's a weight limit to how much you can carry. And it's good to pick gear and weapons appropriately for the mission as they actually influence its outcome. You wouldn't after all like to take large and loud weapon on a stealthy sabotage action now would you? And I personally really like the fact that many of the 50 available missions can be completed faster and better when avoiding full frontal nudity. I mean, full frontal all guns blazing approach to them. So yeah. Clearly it's not an arcade shooter, but more of a tactical one. If you never played it, give it a go, it's surprisingly fun. Blast Chamber is an action puzzler taking place in full 3D rooms, titular chambers, for up to 4 players on consoles and 2 on PC. In single player the game is a typical puzzler where you have to complete each level before venturing to the next one. You do so by dropping a crystal orb in the reactor before the time runs out. If it does, your character dies. But the gimmick with the game is that it's an inverted cube, or more likely a cube that you're inside of. And you can kick the walls of that cube at certain points to have the entire chamber rotate in that direction. And that mechanic is crucial for completing any and all of the levels available in the game. And even more so in competitive multiplayer where you have to place objects in opposing player's crystal and in the same time rotate the chamber slash cube to make sure that the crystal's owner doesn't get to it. It's probably best played in multiplayer having drinks, but if you're playing it dry, single player is the way to go. Its unique mechanic and fun factor allow for quite a lot of replayability. Fun fact, all of the full versions of the game on PC circling around the internet are actually bootlegged copies because the developer never released a full version on PC officially, only a demo. As the title suggests, blood is full of it. Blood, that is. It's a first-person perspective shooter made with Duke Nukem 3D's build engine and one of the best 2.5D shooters of the time. It's excellent, it uses grim and gloomy atmosphere, it has a very dark sense of humor, memorable enemies and a lot of very imaginative weapons to choose from. It's definitely not for the kids though, as gods and gore are galore here and it's not unusual to find bodies in various states of decomposition and fountains of blood after each enemy death. It's not a cheap gimmick though and the game has a pretty interesting even if a bit simple and shallow story to follow. Levels are designed in a very clever and memorable way, often having numerous hidden areas behind destructive walls or moving objects and floors. Enemies are not your typical soldiers or hell monsters, but mostly undead of various kinds that you dispose of using appropriately themed weaponry, with Pitchfork, Voodoo Doll and Aerosol Khan to name a few. Blood is a really fun game to complete alone and is fun to fight against friends in multiplayer. Was it as popular as Duke Nukem 3D? No, it wasn't but perhaps it should have been, as it's at least as good if not better. The only difference being the main protagonist, Caleb, who while having some really cool one-liners to speed here and there, is sadly not as iconic as the Duke. Shake it, baby. Bubble Pop is a modern take on Bubble Bubble with some interesting gameplay ideas. It offers over 100 levels spread over 5 big game worlds, 20 bonus stages, 5 huge bosses that are creatively designed and a true challenge to beat, 20 different enemy types, all unique to each game world and 4 available weapons. Freezing Cloud, Fireball, Fire Shield and Magic Bubble. All rolled into one. So it's Bubble Bubble on steroids. Story is as silly as in most single screen platformers, so you have to save Bubblina from the so-called evil one. And that's creativity at over 9000 boys and girls. Cause if there's one way a villain should be named to cause fear, it's the evil one. Simple, to the point and factually correct. Bubble Pop features a lot of power-ups like invisibility for instance, and is basically a better version of Bubble Bubble, with graphics and sound on par with the standard for the era. Without the Epic's original's main tune, but other than that, better and a pleasure to play both alone or with a friend. Sidox is a shoot em up for one or two players that can be played cooperatively or in a deathmatch. It's an improved version of earlier Cyberdox and features more streamlined gameplay, campaign editor and multiple single player and co-op campaigns, each spread over numerous smaller missions. They usually require either killing of all enemies or finding and pick up of a mission critical object. 
Sidox is best known for its fast and fun action and could be, although it's a bit of a stretch, considered a spiritual successor to Chaos Engine. I mostly played it in deathmatch against a friend back in the day and that's how I remember it. A fast and crazy shooter where we were trying to get as many points as possible while in the same time cursing his keyboard for being able to process only as many inputs at the same time, often causing one of us to either not dodge the shot or not shoot when the limit was reached. Fun times. Today, Sidox is best played in its newer freeware iteration of Sidox SDL, where community same as it did for original, keeps dropping new campaigns for fans of the game to enjoy. Carmageddon is what Armageddon with Bruce Willis is based on, cars being shot into space with kamikaze drivers aiming themselves into a comet in an act of desperation to save humanity at the cost of their own lives. Only not really and not at all. Carmageddon, same as its successor released a year later, is one of the best arcade over-the-top racers ever made. It's a natural evolution of races like Supercars, Death Rally or Destruction Derby in more advanced 3D engine with even more brutality all throughout than ever before. In essence, the races are theoretically as in any other game in the genre, meaning you can win them by just completing a certain set number of laps first, before any of your opponents does, but that's not what this game is all about. And there are two other winning conditions, both more fun and more likely what you'll be aiming to do on each track. So you can also win by incapacitating all pedestrians, which is easier said than done as there can be upwards of even 500 of these per track, or, and that's the goal most aim for, you can destroy all other cars. Each race has a certain set time to complete either of the goals, but you can extend it by running over the pedestrians or damaging other cars. It's a simple yet enjoyable formula that hardly ever gets old and the game feels nigh infinitely replayable. Especially that all 36 tracks included are very well designed too, often open form and full of secret passages, jumps and hills so that even if racing you'll inevitably end up performing tricks whether you aim to or not, and land on other cars, ramming into them at high speed or splashing a passerby here and there. But wait! That's not all. There are numerous active and passive power-ups that can affect your car, your opponents or even pedestrians, and all come with their own set of bonuses if used correctly. If you like Distraction Derby, Carmageddon with its dynamic damage system and addictive gameplay would be a dream come true for you. Chasm The Rift is a first-person shooter where the evil group known as Time Strikers opens up series of ruptures in time, through which they invade three different periods present day, ancient Egypt and medieval times. All that to destroy life on earth as we know it. And guess who is sent to deal with them? Not the army, cause clearly even combined forces of all nations are not fit for the cause, not the special forces, spies or mercenaries. Similar case, they're just not good enough. Duke Nukem and Master Chief both seem to be away on holiday or something as it's not them either. And no, as much as you'd like him to be, it's not Gordon Freeman. It's you. Yeah, you heard it right, soldier. Gear up, cause at dawn you march to fight the enemy. Chasm is full 3D and none of that 2.5D crap. And it features pretty good for the time graphics, interesting in their design 16 kinds of enemies, appropriate for the periods they're set in and for bosses that are really unique in both, the way they look and the way they fight. It's a pretty fun and well thought out shooter that would have no doubt been more successful if it released a year or two earlier. In 1997 we had Quake 2 for Windows. And Chasm, while pretty competent and fun game, was just not Quake. You may not know it in 2023, but 10 years ago in 2013 Earth was attacked and conquered by aliens. And it took them mere weeks. Humanity was enslaved and our planet was assimilated and appropriately renamed to Colony 28. And all you do, feel, see or experience today is a simulation. Similar to what robots served humanity in the Matrix. With a small difference that we're not locked into jello filled coffins but are turned into simple cyborgs doing aliens bidding. Basically a slave force for the occupiers. And this is when our protagonist regains his former memories, due to an unexpected malfunction. A glitch in the matrix perhaps. He decides to turn against the aliens and single-handedly save the world. Because why not? If movies from the 80s taught us anything it's that one person against the whole army of invaders is always unfair. But not to that one person. Because by a random chain of events, luck or the way the stars are aligned that particular day, that person always ends up being secretly the biggest badass humanity has ever spawned. Oh, and that's you. Colony 28 is a side-scrolling action platformer where you control a cyborg and fight against the invaders. The game is divided into multiple levels, each of these is considered completed when all the tasks assigned to it are done, one of your arms is equipped with a machine gun that can use three different kinds of ammo. And if that ever runs out, you can always use your fists to combat the enemies. Fights are more strategic than in your typical shooter and employ similar to that used in Blackthorn shoot and hide mechanic. 
meaning full-on all guns blazing approach is not really a viable option in Colony 28. Comanche 3 is a third of Nova Logic's RAH-66 Comanche Attack Copter Simulator where you fly in revered Griffin Squadron. The game's same as previous titles in the series features a very sophisticated and true-to-life physics engine and it is said that US test pilots ensured the quality and realism of the simulation. I have no way of confirming it now, so you either have to take my word for it or ignore it entirely. Comanche 3 offers full featured tutorial and easy and advanced flight models for those less and more proficient pilots respectively. Naturally, all environments are rendered by Novalogic's own Voxel Space 2 technology that provides a very natural looking jungles, forest, mountain ranges and sand dunes. If you love combat flight simulators, you like Comanche 3 too. If you don't, I don't know. Try it if you feel like it. All is fair in love and war, and construction is war. And that is the prevalent theme in Constructor. In essence, it's a fun, tongue-in-cheek business simulation where you're the estate developer competing against other companies in the same line of work. The game is played in an isometric perspective and allows for construction of 40 different structures. So you'll be raising housing estates for all classes of citizens and also workplaces, services and amenities that would keep them happy, employed and in line. But what you'll also be doing is fighting off the competition, and you really don't have to play fair. In fact, okay, it's probably best if you don't. Okay. You can set fires to opponents' buildings, yeah. capture said buildings, send hippies so ghosts, yes, ghosts, or even tax to opponents' properties. And you can even employ thieves to steal from them. In the same time, you have to prevent opponents from doing the same to you by assigning police patrols to key areas to secure your properties. You need to keep your tenants happy and comply with their request as best as you can. Constructor is a balancing act of growth, prosperity and a little sabotage. All in a very fun, similar to theme park in the way the people behave and act, environment full of funny situations and quirky personalities. But don't let the laughs fool you, Constructor is anything but shallow and the underlying economics model is while humorously approached, actually pretty sound and solid. Counteraction is a real-time strategy riding on the wave of popularity of behemoths of the genre like Command and & Conquer and Warcraft, but set in East Front during World War II. And you can lead either of the sides, Russian or German, each with a separate 14 mission strong campaign. Interestingly enough, Counteraction omits building management and resource gathering present in other RTS titles entirely, and the only thing you really have to focus on is commanding your forces and using them to the best of your abilities. I don't want to lie to you here guys and tell you stories about the game I don't know much about, I only know what I read online and saw in reviews and YouTube videos. So it looks interesting, most of the reviews from Gaming Max were rather positive when it released, but not all, and if you like what you see and think it may be something for you, give it a go, what's there to lose in the end, right? Upon its release Descent to Under Mountain was scolded for its poor design in terms of both graphical presentation fidelity and performance. Even the fastest systems of the time struggled with running it smoothly in full screen mode. And graphics it displayed did not justify such a state of affairs in no way. If that wasn't enough, the game was ridden with bugs and stripped of promise to gamers before launch, online co-op multiplayer in AD&D setting. So, as you might have guessed already, it didn't fare very well with either critics or gamers. But that was years ago when people still cared for it and what it failed to deliver. And we're here now, today. And as a retro role-playing title, it's not as bad as I made it out to be. Sure, all the aforementioned issues prevail, but we have a much faster system now and much higher border of acceptance when it comes to fidelity in old classic games. To the point that often certain low-quality assets are fondly remembered. Anyway, people in the city of Waterdeep are disappearing in mysterious circumstances and you, a lone adventurer, are asked to descend into Under Mountain to determine what happened and where they went off to. In the process, you also have to find 8 pieces of an amulet that's used to control the legendary flame sword of Lolf. The sword grants its wielder power to command infinite army and save Waterdeep. Descent to Undermountain is played from the first person perspective and while it's not the best game in the genre by any metric, it's probably more playable now than it was when it released. Hail to the king, baby! And the king I am not, as if I was one, I would have remembered about Duke Nukem 3D in the previous video for 1996 when it actually released. Funny thing, I had the footage, I've written the preview for it and only when I was putting the video together in the editing software, I forgot to add it in. So yeah, Duke Nukem 3D, you should be hearing about a couple of weeks ago, is a fun and full of dark humor and pop culture references 2.5D first person shooter that you definitely know of already. You played and loved it when you saw it first more than 20 years ago. The end.
Well, that was easier than I thought. Seems like talking about the game everyone knows can be both easy and I don't have to touch the subject of said game at all. At least with the footage in the background running and me spitting random sentences in the air. You haven't commented on it yet, so clearly it must be working. Duke Nukem 3D was the first FPS I played in multiplayer against friends. And while I did play earlier games in Deathmatch 2, it was actually not on their original release dates. And Duke was my first. Wow, I just realized how bad it sounded. Anyway, I don't think I've ever rediscovered the same feeling of fun in multiplayer shooters as I had when playing Duke. It was just great. Hiding somewhere, checking the cameras, trying to snipe that buddy of yours who seemingly disappeared, just to have him jump out from behind and shot you straight up, because he was following you, stealthily, so that whenever you looked for him on cameras, they didn't spot him because he was not far and well hidden. It was bliss. A feeling I don't get from today's shooters. Oh, and I loved Build Editor 2. I actually remade my home back then in it with obligatory secret passage behind the toilet. Because why the hell not? In the end, we've watched some Duke Nukem 3D footage for the last couple of minutes. I've talked for a while, not necessarily about it, but I did. And we had fun and I can get back to other games in a more serious manner. Dungeon Keeper is an oddity. It's a part real-time strategy, part settlement management, part tower defense minus the towers, and finally part first-person combat game. And when these parts combine, I am Captain Planet... Oh, uh, my bad, wrong video. Obviously, I meant that with all this combined, what we're left of is amazingly addictive and a very fun game that's a pleasure to play today, as much as it was originally. You have to construct and manage a dungeon, recruit and train minions to defend it, you mine for gold and gems, set traps, build rooms, each with its own unique purpose and use case, and cast spells. I know that these last two sentences were a lot to process, but Dungeon Keeper is all that and more. Your main task is to defend your dungeon hard, cause when that falls, you lose. And you protect it from heroes that keep invading your dungeon, fighting your creatures, hunting for treasures, and ultimately trying to get to that dungeon hard. The heroes are not boring knights only either, and can be among others, giants, wizards or even samurais. As you progress through the game and unlock new rooms and creatures, you'll keep finding new ways to experience, enjoy and progress within the world of Dungeon Keeper and its 20 regions to conquer. Each of the creatures you build the rooms for is different both in stats and their behavior, and some are natural enemies, so you should not build rooms willy-nilly just wherever it suits you, but plan ahead. Spiders and flies are natural enemies, for instance, so keeping them close will never yield good results. Dungeon Keeper is amazing, it may not look like anything special in this short preview video, but believe me, that it's so good that not many games of 1997 could compare to it in terms of playability. Especially that up to 4 Dungeon Masters could play it together via modem or LAN. It's a gem. Earth 2140 is a real-time strategy by seemingly unknown at the time Polish developer Topware. Today, obviously, they have a lot of great titles behind them, but back then, they weren't as well known. The game depicts futuristic conflict between two opposing factions, United Civilized States and Eurasian Dynasty, for the remaining Earth's resources. Sounds like something you've heard before? Because it's not far off from Command and Conquer's plot. And it doesn't really have to be, because it's not the plot people play RTSs for, but the gameplay loop. And here it's pretty standard formula of gather, build and fight. Both sides have unique buildings and units and play a little different, so completing the campaign with either is equally as fun. Earth 2140 offered novel at the time features as well, something that we've grown used to by now, but then they were the new thing. Like ability to recruit special units that would cloak all other friendly units around it, or another one that could convert damaged enemies to your side. While Earth 2140 may not have been the best RTS in 1997, it was definitely worth a look if you were into this. Ecstatica 2 starts directly after the first one and is still a survival adventure horror with action-based combat. This time, however, the game world is much bigger and features some free roaming areas. You can use various weapons and in time spells either by found magic scrolls or an equipped magic staff. It's a bigger, better and more impressive version of the first game and should be a definite pickup for fans of survival horrors. It's still using rather odd but interesting sphere-based engine. After saving Ecstatica, her and protagonist of the first game hear about Archmates summoning demons to our hero's homeland, slaughtering or transforming people living there into brutal killing machines. To defeat the evil Archmage, the hero has to find all pieces of the Elder Sign scattered around the land and use it to banish the demon forces. All of them but the last are protected by the Dark Sorceress, and last is kept along with kidnapped Ecstatica by the Archmage himself. War. War never changes. And the great nuclear war that wiped most of life from face of the earth was no different. Brutal, devastating, but also a short one. 
It took but a day to lay devastation to our world, and what emerged after was a wasteland with small communities spread over large distances split with radioactive wastes full of dangerous raiders and mutants of various kinds. We are an inhabitant of one of the vaults, large pre-war bunkers that were supposedly built to hold large chunks of population safe after nuclear holocaust. Yours, Vault 13, however, had its water chip broken. A purification controller chip without which the vault has no access to clean water. You're sent into the waste to find the replacement and you have 150 days to do so. Initially. As if you play your cards right, you can double it during one of the quest lines. Fallout is a post-apocalyptic role-playing game set in a wasteland of what was once US West Coast. The game world is entirely free to explore from the get-go and you can go anywhere you'd like. It doesn't mean that you're equipped to deal with what you find there, but you can go wherever you feel like it. The main quest is interesting and will take you through a series of hoops to complete, but it's not overly long. Fallout's depth and length comes from hundreds of side quests, big and small, that are spread out through whole game world and enhance the gameplay experience to feel more immersive and characters you meet more real. Fallout features a very fun and well-designed turn-based combat system and uses action points as a basis for all of the movement and attacks during encounters. You can attack, aiming your shots or swings depending on the weapon you use at various body parts of all enemies and that choice can result in increased accuracy or critical chances. After all, head is much more fragile appendix than the armies, right? But since we're on the combat, the game is built in a way that allows completing it without ever actually fighting, by either avoiding or running from encounters and solving conflicts via conversations, provided your skills would allow for that, that is. Fallout is the first title in my beloved series of role-playing games and, in my personal opinion, best role-playing of 1997. Fragile Allegiance is a space-based strategy and a greatly revamped version of Amiga Classic K240. To simplify, you have to find, colonize and exploit all of the resources of various asteroids spread over the universe. As soon as you start mining precious ores, you'll begin selling them to Federal Oil Transporter, and you do so expanding your empire until you have enough to start focusing on a fleet of warships. Which you should do earlier rather than later, because there's an evil alien race going by the name of the Mona, and they are bent on conquering and destruction of all other races. You are not alone in your struggles against the Mona, however, as other aliens seem to be as eager to get rid of the threat as you are. So negotiation of peace treaties and combat alliances is a must and a means to secure your well-being. Especially that biological combat is one of the means that both you and the Mauna may use on each other's asteroid colonies. Space combat is rather fun and well executed too, with fleets that you can fully customize to suit your needs, so for once it's not an afterthought in a 4x title, but a well-crafted part of the game. If you've never played Fragile Allegiance and are into strategies, especially those set in space, it's definitely one not to sleep on. Grand Theft Auto is the first in the series of blockbuster from zero to anti-hero games, where you as a small-time criminal aim to become the big mob. And I have to say that for the first attempt, it's amazing. I've spent hours upon hours playing it back in the day and completing more and more demanding missions, unlocking new parts of and the cities, and it felt really rewarding. There are three cities overall, divided into six parts. Liberty City is based on NYC, San Andreas on San Francisco, and Vice City on Miami. Funny enough, all these were to become settings for individual 3D games in the series few years later. Missions are picked up by answering phones or entering special cars, and they can be anything from robberies to assassinations. Completing a mission raises your score and score multiplier. So if you complete few of these in a row without failure, your score should stack up quite rapidly. Nothing comes free though, and as you complete more and more daring felonies, your wanted level will grow and police will send more and more units to grab you. You can escape by respraying your car in the shop, but the nature of the game will have you running from them quite often one way or another. The cities are fully explorable and viewed from the top-down perspective that's zooming out when you're in a car for easier controls at high speed. There are numerous different weapons available, from pistol all the way to the rocket launchers, and they can be found either lying around in back alleys or in one of the multiple spread around the city crates. There are other bonuses too, so you may end up picking armor, extra lives, police bribes and even get out of jail free cards. And last but not least, basically any vehicle seen in the game can be driven, so that's everything from small cars through police and fire truck vehicles, all the way to buses and even a tank. Grand Theft Auto was the game that placed DMA design on a path to become Rockstar one of the most beloved and most successful developers out there. And it's easy to tell why. GTA is amazing and as playable today as it was in 1997. Halls of the Dead aka Fairy Tale Adventure 2 is the light role-playing follow-up to earlier first Fairy Tale Adventure. 
Same as in previous installment, you control three brothers, who this time are teleported to a mysterious foreign land and have to save it from evil powers that are ravaging it. The game is half adventure, half role playing, and its best and most beloved by the fans of the first part feature is still present and it's even better. The game world. It's huge, gigantic even, dynamic and densely populated. There's seemingly always something to do somewhere, plenty of townsfolk to talk to, interesting main quests and hundreds of side quests. It's just a pleasure to immerse yourself in. Especially that it's not very demanding and also why I initially called it a light role-playing. Because it focuses more on storytelling and adventuring rather than raising stats and carefully optimizing your character builds. One difference to the first game is that now you can actually control all three brothers at once and they can be kept together or separated to be sent off to different parts of the map. House of the Dead is an excellent experience for those who are either new to action RPGs or those that like games with involving story and well-crafted characters. Gaimo is a side-scrolling action platformer similar to Alien Carnage but less brutal. To summarize the story, entity known as Nectarion conquered Bitland and declared his will to destroy humanity. And you're Gaimo, a lone hero who will prevent it. Because you will. You won't fail and the world will be forever in debt to you, right? Right. Gaimo features beautiful console-like graphics, lush backgrounds and smooth animation. On the adventure you'll face many different enemies and monsters, but you can blast them with your trusty gun, which is not your only means of defense as there are a total of 10 different weapons to find and many power-ups. The levels are big and feature many active and passive obstacles like fireballs, moving platforms and traps, and secret passages that are opening up new passageways for more varied subsequent playthroughs. Gaimo is really fun, but coming from a Brazilian developer and having very little recognition outside of the country, it never received the acclaim it deserved. Especially cause aside from really well crafted gameplay loop, it also introduced many features not seen in other games in the genre before. Like sidekicks that follow you and can be issued simple orders, and enemy AI that will have monsters running for reinforcement when in danger and track your movements, as opposed to your typical in-platformers pre-assigned paths based traversal. And last but not least, KID difficulty level that handles all the obstacles and movement in chosen direction so that the child could focus on shooting and picking the direction to take. It's a great game for anyone and everyone in all age groups. Imperium Galactica is a forex strategy with sci-fi storyline and adventure game elements. It features narrative story introduction and cutscenes throughout the gameplay in various points and upon receiving promotions. You start the game as lieutenant, assigned to get the war-ravaged colony of Achilles back online. As you do that and other smaller missions, you'll get promoted to captain. This will earn you a better ship and enable access to production screen. It's used to develop spacecraft, weaponry and starship equipment technologies. At the next rank of commander, you'll be allowed to research new technologies. You also get a flagship to command and space combat itself will become deeper and better, allowing you to pick battle strategies before fights. Finally, a promotion to admiral unlocks more storyline progression than the previous promotions did you'll get even better ship and additional colony options. You'll be able to travel to and colonize other planets and make contact with alien races. Regardless of the rank, you'll always have a certain number of colonies to manage and take care of. And you can customize them to suit your needs, changing them into long-range scouting outposts or factories, among others. Imperium Galactica is a hybrid of many different genres, but while it may seem like an odd mishmash of ideas and something that shouldn't work, it's actually quite the opposite and it ends up being not only really fun, but also deep and engaging experience. KKND Crash, Kill and Destroy is first in trilogy of post-apocalyptic real-time strategy games. In 2140 after the world has collapsed, two remaining factions fight for control of Earth and its last remaining resources worth anything, especially most important of them, oil. They are the survivors, so humans who waited out the destruction underground in relative safety, and the evolved, mutants who survived the catastrophe on the surface. All is used as the primary resource to earn the currency required to construct buildings and train new needs, and interestingly enough, most buildings can be upgraded multiple times to unlock new options within them. Both factions have entirely different sets of units, with survivors utilizing high-tech vehicles of various kinds and evolved mainly using mutated animals. Each faction has its own 15 missions long campaign and they're both pretty fun if you like the genre. Both gamers and critics seem to think alike as the game not only sold quite well, but also spawned two follow-up titles in the coming years. Man of War is a very unusual game and most either love it or hate it, because it can be both really boring and very immersive, depending on your interest in naval combat and time period. Man of War is a mixture of strategy and first-person perspective walking simulator. 
I'm exaggerating with that second bit, but in the most part, that's what it is. The game is basically your naval battle simulator, but played from the point of view of a fleet admiral. You can pick either historical or custom battles, and when you do so, the game starts and you play it in alternating turns. Top-down view strategic one, where you can issue a set of very limited orders to the ships in your fleet, and this may seem a bit simplistic, but if you think of it, most admirals at the time could issue only very basic orders during combat, as there were no direct means of contact like radios and such. In this phase, time is paused. After all orders are issued, the game switches into real-time first-person perspective execution phase, which takes up to 4 minutes. During execution phase, you're free to move about your flagship and observe the results of orders you've given in real time. There's nothing more you can do here, just walk around and watch how the battle's playing out. After 4 minutes pass, it's back to planning, and then rinse and repeat till the battle is over. Some may find the observation phase boring, but I kinda enjoyed it, especially that Man of War is a game unlike any other, and I really enjoy new experiences in gaming, even if they're not necessarily what I initially thought they would be. MDK is a 3D action-adventure shooter. In the time when most new 3D shooters used the first-person perspective to ride on the Doom's wave of popularity, MDK opted out for third-person and that decision ended up being a bullseye choice. The story of MDK is not very deep, but it's a good background to excellent gameplay. Aliens threaten the Earth, you're Kurt, and you have your special battlesuit and a sniper rifle attached to your arm, and you're out to rid the Earth of the aliens' camp. Your suit allows you to jump higher than you'd otherwise could, glide when dropping from high points and also store picked up power-ups and items for later use. While the gameplay is incredibly linear, basically taking you room by room through all the levels, they are all very well designed and introducing new mechanics often so you won't ever feel bored or as if you were repeating something you've done before to death. But all the variety, immersively crafted puzzles and gameplay elements come at the cost. Innovation has its limits, especially if a game is to innovate all throughout and the cost here is the length. Finishing MDK in 10-12 hours is nothing out of ordinary, and while very fun on the first go as you learn new things all the time and figure out how to solve certain puzzles, linearity of the adventure heavily limits replayability. Mortal Kombat Trilogy is my third most favorite game in the series, straight after Mortal Kombat 1 and 2 respectively. Sadly, I did not fancy Mortal Kombat 3 at all. So, the trilogy gathers up all characters and bosses from three earlier games and tackles them against each other. So not only you get to play as bosses from previous outings, but can also take part in fights between same characters in two different iterations, like Old Sub-Zero versus the new one, for instance. Trilogy uses improved engine from Mortal Kombat 3 and all character sprites apart from the Johnny Cage's ones were converted from earlier games to it. Johnny Cage's sprites had to be remade because Midway fired the actor who played him, Daniel Pessina, or because he seemingly dressed up as Johnny Cage to advertise a different competing arcade game, Bloodstorm. So, Chris Alexander was asked to fulfill the role. I don't think that there's any story in this one, at least I don't remember it, but if you liked 1 and 2, the trilogy should be nearly as fun to spend some time in, especially if you have someone to fight against. Nebula Fighter is a side-scrolling space shoot-em-up not unlike our type. The story behind the game is that at some point in time, all the terrorist groups united, because why not, game logic for the win, and formed one huge unstoppable army. Now if you think of it, the idea is beyond stupid. Do you realize how good it would be if all terrorist groups would unite and form a single big unit? I mean, they could be wiped off the face of the earth in one sweep move. Well, it's not the case in the game though, and they somehow took over the world. Shortly after, alien race visited Earth, which led the group to realize that there are other worlds to conquer. They've captured an alien ship, built a fleet, and sent out a single pilot to break through alien defenses. And that pilot is no one else but you. Yep, you're playing for the bad side this time. Same as in most games in the genre, you upgrade your ship by picking up energy pods that drop after defeating enemies. There's 21 levels in Nebula Fighter, and despite the god-awful plot behind it, the game is actually pretty fun and a treat to the fans of the genre. By a set of unfortunate events, our three heroes from the first game, Eric the Swift, Olaf the Stout and Balog the Fierce, are sent through time again, and they have to find their way back home once more. This time, however, their abilities have been slightly altered, and along the way they meet two new friends who help them on their quest, werewolf named Funk and dragon named Scorch. Other than that, the game plays same as it always did, and it's a side-scrolling puzzle platformer where you have to get to each level's end to progress further. It may, however, require solving some environmental puzzles or collecting specific items. Only three out of five characters are ever present in each level, and the levels themselves are designed in a way to require use of all of the three skills to complete. Unlike in original, The Lost Vikings 2, you can actually play with a friend in simultaneous co-op where each of you controls one character and any of you can switch to the third one at any given moment. 
which may not sound like much, but for avid fans of multiplayer experiences same as myself, it was a huge upgrade and guaranteed subsequent playthroughs. What I don't like about the game though are the graphics. In original, all sprites were pixel artsy and carefully crafted to show as much detail as possible in a limited resolution available to the machines at the time. Here, sprites are pre-rendered, which at the time may have appeared great looking, but pre-rendered assets age much worse than pixel graphics. When our protagonist ape overhears that his race of Madokons that's been enslaved by the evil Glacons to work in their huge corporations is actually a delicacy, a source of incredibly delicious and popular meat for the Glacons, he decides to run away and save as many of his brethren as possible. Oddworld Apes Odyssey is an action puzzle platformer that was very popular, especially on Sony PlayStation, for having beautiful presentation, interesting gameplay mechanic and a very well thought out mixture of puzzling and quick time arcade elements. It's also a game I never liked. Regardless of how many times I've tried making myself get into it, I always failed. It's just not for me and I can't tell why. Perhaps because it's so unforgiving it feels like Souls-like games, which is another genre I despise for being more frustrating than rewarding, or perhaps something else. I will never know as I will never try it out again. But generally speaking, I'm in a very, very tiny vocal minority. Most critics and gamers of the time loved it, found it enchanting and challenging just enough to keep them entertained, but not enough to cause anger and annoyance. So if you're not an avid hater of Souls games, same as I am, perhaps Oddworld is something you might find yourself liking. Pro Pinball Time Shock is one of the best early real 3D pinballs. As the title suggests, the main theme is the time travel, and as you play the game and unlock different periods, you'll be able to access the present day, distant future, ancient Rome and prehistoric age times. The game features four different camera views for the most immersive experience possible and plenty of videos in the dot matrix display to keep you entertained. Interesting fact, in 2014 Dutch company Silver Castle Pinball purchased rights to it aiming to create a real life version of Timeshock. And while few prototypes were released since then, the company seems to have went bankrupt shortly after and currently its Twitter, website and Facebook seems to be inactive and we never got to see Timeshock converted to a real arcade table. Reloaded is a top-down action arcade shooter and a sequel to Loaded, a popular PlayStation game that was never released on PC. For whatever reason, Reloaded was not very well known on computers and was sorta of hidden gem that disappeared in the sea of more well-known games. And it's a shame, cause it's pretty fun and full of furious action. It starts directly after Loaded and is as full of violence and gore as the first game was, if not more. The screen is constantly filled with massive explosions, bullet showers and flying body parts, and you have six characters to choose from, and while each prefers a different kind of a weapon, they don't feel that much unique from one another gameplay-wise. The game feels like a modern take on Gauntlet that's faster, bloodier and more demanding. Reloaded features occasional simple puzzles that, while on the easier side, are a nice break from constant shooting. As with most games in the genre, Reloaded is obviously a much better experience when enjoyed with a friend especially when friendly fire option is turned on, adding a lot of craziness to this already fast-paced romp. Realms of the Hunting is a mixture of an adventure and first-person shooter. It uses improved version of Normality's engine and serves very deep and good occult adventure using heaps upon heaps of full-motion videos spread over four game CDs. While you're experiencing the game world through the first-person viewpoint, there's a free-floating mouse hand on the screen at all times, used to interact with the objects in the game. Puzzles you'll be solving are generally speaking logical and not based on trial and error, but quite often you'll be pixel hunting for that one particular object or place to click on. It's not a game breaking issue, but definitely something worth mentioning. Story wise, Realms of the Haunting starts off as a typical haunted house story, but soon enough it evolves into end of the world tale occult based drama. You're Adam Randall, a son of deceased priest and you're sent off to investigate a haunted mansion that's supposedly linked to your father's death. It quickly turns out that the mansion is an old satanic temple and it's full of both demons and evil spirits. Inside it turns out that the person who sent you there is actually a 500 years old sorcerer who's bent on a world destruction. The game's really good, so if you like adventure horror titles and don't mind FMV plots, you'll love it. Redneck Rampage is a 2.5D first person shooter made with Duke Nukem 3D's build engine and taking place in backwater small town of Hickston, Arkansas. The levels range from trailer parks to chicken processing plants and everything in between. And weapons you get to use are also setting appropriate, and can be a gun shooting saw blades, TNT crossbow or a machine gun bra to name a few. Power-ups are also in team, with whiskey and pork rinds instead of your typical in FPS shooters armor and health kits. I have to admit that other than Duke Nukem, Redneck Rampage is probably my most favorite shooter made using the engine. 
as it's really fun and hilariously over the top. Story-wise, aliens invaded Earth and abducted inhabitants of your redneck town, replacing them with clones. What's worse, however, they stole your brothers and yours prize pig Bessie, so you playing as Leonard have to do both, defeat the aliens and evil clones and recover your beloved Porky. While I may have not played Screamer Rally as much as I did the earlier two, it doesn't reflect negatively on the quality of this game. It features four cars, two front tractions and two 4x4, with each having their own statistics of acceleration, braking and weight, and each feeling entirely different, even more so than ever before, as handling, tire type and pressure, both suspensions and brakes can be customized in the garage. It drops entirely arcade racing for a more rally-like approach, similar to that of Sega Rally, but, dare I say it, considerably more enjoyable. Screamer Rally has a few game modes to choose from, arcade mode where you can race for fun against 5 opponents, time attack mode with checkpoints against the ghost of a previous best run, and championship slash league where you compete in 4 consecutive leagues and get to unlock new tracks. You start with 3 of these and end up with 7. I have a very fond memories of Screamer 2 and that's why it will always be my favorite in the series, but if I was to be objective, I'd have to risk saying that this third game is arguably the best arcade racer out of all three. Tennis Elbow is a tennis simulation and we haven't spoke about one in a few episodes now. I suppose there just weren't any good ones. But eventually we got here and Tennis Elbow is actually ace. It allows up to 4 players to compete in a world tour of 90 events against 250 tennis players. The game features all the real court surfaces, grass, clay, flexi and cement, and you can create your own player, define him as a volleyer, defender, puncher or varied. And as you play the game, his abilities will improve, resulting in real and actually noticeable difference in his running speed, serve accuracy and bigger jumps. Controls use arrow keys and two buttons and allow for performing slices, three different types of lobs and subtle drop shots. There weren't many good non-football sports simulations released in the second half of the 90s, but Tennis Elbow is definitely one. So if you're into tennis or just like sports games, this one's a good one. Terra Fire is a multi-directional shooter with beautiful ray-traced graphics, parallax backgrounds and undeniable similarities to earlier game Thrust. Unlike in most other shooter maps, you're not limited in movement to just one direction and can move freely in 360 degrees arc. The game features 27 levels and every fourth is a special bonus level similar in a way it's played to another classic, Asteroids. Normal levels feature gravity and are completed by locating a nuke hidden within them and dragging it out to the top of the level. The gameplay in Terrafire is less hectic than in other shooters with much more sparse enemies and no bosses. It also focuses most on finding and disposing of nukes rather than combat with the enemies. It's a really unusual shooter but one that's surprisingly fun to immerse yourself in. If you're looking for a different kind of arcade game, this may be the one to try out. The City of Lost Children is a difficult game to gauge. On one side it's a tie to a very intriguing and disturbing movie that features beautiful graphics and smooth gameplay in perfectly realized dark 3D world, and on another it's very short, many of the things you do in the game feel as if they were repeating, fetch quests especially, although using the word quests is not really appropriate in this particular case. And even worse, most of the story behind what's happening in the game is not explained in it at all, so you either have to watch the movie first or know it beforehand. I'll do you a solid and summarize it for you so you don't have to worry about it. Basically, an evil and mad scientist Kirk has been rapidly aging because he cannot dream. To combat the issue, he sends his henchman, the Cyclops, to kidnap children at night so that he could steal their dreams with a mysterious contraption. All in hopes of reversing or at the very least stopping the rapid aging. Dark, isn't it? Well, City of Lost Children is an interesting even if short game despite all the little annoyances. So if you feel like playing a 3D adventure that's unlike anything else, you may want to give it a go. The fourth generation is a very competent and well-designed side-scrolling shoot-em-up for one or two players set in space on brink of the conflict that may soon happen between the factions of Florian and the opposing Qualix and Nimbur. The game features 11 missions and between the levels you get to upgrade and repair your ship if necessary. The repair option is especially interesting because many of the onboard systems may get damaged during combat resulting in a reduction or loss of certain abilities, like maneuverability, targeting or even firing weapons so it's worth to keep your ship in tip-top shape. The graphics are very nice and are pre-rendered, adding that 3D feeling to them, while actually being entirely to the sprites and backgrounds. Sound design is solid, but nothing to write home about, and not below the genre average in any way either. Why did I call it competent then initially and not good or great? Because that's what it is, competent. It feels as if it was crafted just to tick off all the requirements to make a shooter and not with love and passion for the genre. 
The difficulty is pretty low, the bosses are not very demanding and innovative, and enemy designs feel repeatable. Don't get me wrong though, it's not a bad game, it's just not something you'll remember for long after playing. Time Warriors is a 3D versus fighting game that puts 8 fighters from different periods and places against each other. You could say that they're taken out of their time and they're the, well, Time Warriors. The characters you can pick from are Arwen the Celt, armed with a long sword, Heis is the Egyptian with two sabers, Moloch the Barbarian wielding his battle axe, Sultan is Baal, armed with a scimitar, Shodan the Samurai and his katana, Olaf the Viking wielding a warhammer, Spartan Apocles using double-edged sword, and Chinese Dong with his staff. Now that I said it, I realized it would have sounded much better if I said Dong the Chinese or Dong from China, but it's a bit late now and I'll leave it the way it is. So Chinese Dong, as opposed to European or Pan-American Dong. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Anyway, the game features four button controls, two for fast attacks and two for strong ones, divided into two groups, one for weapon and other for kicks. Combos are not pre-programmed, but are done with repeating key presses fast or chaining of sequential moves. So they feel very fluid and natural. Gathering enough magic points during fights allows for unleashing a devastating special attack, which is something worth keeping in mind. While Time Warriors is definitely not the best 3D versus fighting game, it's not the worst either, and fans of the genre could very well spend a minute playing it. Twin Sense Odyssey aka Little Big Adventure 2 is a direct follow-up to the first game, and also an action adventure with some very superficial role-playing elements. Twin Sen, hero of the first game, has gotten married, settled down and is ready to have a child and carry on with his peaceful life. One day, however, his friend Dinofly is mysteriously struck by lightning and hurt, and I would like to pause here for a second to appreciate the creativity behind the name Dinofly. Wow, what an achievement in creative writing. Anyway, after a short investigation, Twinson discovers that it was caused by visitors from outer space. He has no choice but once again to embark on a quest to save his world. Same as in previous game, the viewpoint is top-down isometric and your main focus is traversal around the world and interaction with objects and characters. Once again, all four stances are available and should be used in appropriate places to progress the plot. So normal, aggressive, sneaky and athletic. The game world is much larger this time, offering side quests and many optional objectives, and the only difference from the first game apart from story and scope of the world are the graphics, which are now rendered in real 3D and not pre-rendered. Twin Sense Odyssey is an amazing game, same as the original was, and a very underappreciated title that deserved much more recognition than it ever received. If you like action-adventure games, you'll have a lot of fun with this one, I promise. Vanguard Ace Vertical Madness is a vertical scrolling shoot-em-up not unlike Raptor or Raiden. It has beautiful pre-rendered graphics, super smooth animation and multi-layered parallax scrolling. The game features a lot of weapons and upgrades for them and uses unusual for the titles in a genre HP bar instead of a single hit death system. Meaning a single bullet does not destroy your ship but only reduce your HP bar. It makes the game easier than its arcade counterparts, but that's for the better, as I always found the one-hit death systems very limiting and suited more for the arcades than home games. Vertical Madness is definitely a title for the fans of the shooters, as it's genuinely pretty good. But if you're just a Sunday shoot em up player and don't spend your waking hours dodging thousands of bullets and mowing down the bosses, then there are much better games available for those. And while Vanguard Ace is fine, it really shouldn't be the only game in the genre that you'll be playing. Waterworld is not a very good game. At least I never found it to be entertaining and as far as I know critics didn't either, as it received negative reviews in grand majority of cases. It's a 25 missions long real-time strategy based on a movie of the same title. Basically, you're a war chief of a group of survivors in a water-covered post-apocalyptic world, and you lead the task force of 2 to 14 men, depending on the mission, against the opposing group of smokers, all to return the world to its former glory. So you'll be amassing fresh water, known in game as Hydro, food, weapons and critical information on smokers' location to evade them when possible. I'm not a big fan of real-time strategies, but I can appreciate and even enjoy well-crafted experiences in the genre, so games like Warcraft 2 or Red Alert. I can't recall if I ever found anything enjoyable about Waterworld, but I definitely don't see anything I would enjoy in it now. It's only here because it was an important movie tie-in and it takes place in an interesting setting. Other than that, it actually sucks. War. War never changes. No, sorry, wrong script. Let me start again. Where do I have it? Oh, here. Okay, let's see. War. War never changes. Ah, oh, god damn it. Hey Google, where's my XCOM Apocalypse script? I couldn't find anything related to X, pack of squid. Oh well, seems I'll have to improvise a little. So, 
XCOM Apocalypse is a third game in original XCOM series and a direct follow-up to Terror from the Deep. It's also a game that turned the entire franchise upside down. And my second most favorite DOS game of 1997 trailing only behind Fallout. After the last war things have not gone well for humans and most live in a huge self-sufficient city of Mega Primus. It took a while to rebuild and as soon as everything appeared to be finally changing for the better, strange portals started showing up in the sky over the Megapolis. And surprise surprise, it's the aliens again. And this time, they even more of a threat than ever before. So naturally, XCOM is needed once again to save the day and humanity at the same time. The main core of the series is sustained in the apocalypse, meaning research, development, resource management, micro and macro tactics during missions and in the sky combat respectively, are all preserved. A bit changed, but still present in the game. As usual, you will also have to carefully manage your budget, as not very often you'll be in a situation where you'll have too much cash lying around, and soldiers, vehicles and scientists all have to be recruited and equipped. To the teeth. Now, for what's different, and there's a lot. For starters, beautiful SVGA graphics replace older, lower style base to the engine and allows for much more to be seen at once on the screen, which makes for those longer missions easier to manage without the need to constantly scroll through huge maps all the time. And since we're on a combat, it can either be turn-based or real-time. It's clear that the game was designed with this new real-time approach in mind, but even turn-based lovers such as myself will quickly learn to adapt and either use it or stick to tried and tested turns. I did. Played it in turns, that is and didn't felt as if I was missing anything or being handicapped because of that. There are many more interesting mobs in Apocalypse to fight with the aliens now too, so you'll be tackling outwardly threat in slums, corporate buildings and headquarters, glass encased farms, factories, apartment buildings and in wreckages of downed UFOs. Just to name a few. Most weapons, upgrades and vehicles are entirely new as well and a pleasure to manufacture and then use against the invaders. Aliens themselves are also different, meaning there are a few new kinds of these and some even are really imaginative and clearly inspired by alien franchise of movies. The city of Mega Primus feels a lie. There are mega corporations in it that are constantly at odds with each other and it's them that you have to protect to secure the funding for progress. Not really interest of one of these will be directly opposing to the other and you'll need to make difficult choices along the campaign as it's impossible to please everyone. And if you anger one enough, it may not only become your enemy and engage you in combat, but also even join the alien side. Same goes for small day-to-day -day occurrences in the city. If you hire scientists or purchase something, anything, all these have to be delivered to your base and don't just magically appear in it. So transports, as they are on their way, are susceptible to ambushes and attacks and have to be protected. As much as Apocalypse never received as wide popularity and success as two earlier games did, it was an amazing, even if underrated, title and all fans of originals, if they only give it a chance, will most definitely love it. It's a true sequel and not only an add-on slash conversion that Terror from the Deep was and a good time for weeks on end. X-Men Children of the Atom is one of the last great versus fighting games that released for DOS. And it's really that good that the word great was not misused in the first sentence. You have my word. It's a port from the arcades, but from what I can tell, nothing was lost in conversion. Sprites are as big and colorful, backgrounds are appropriately lush and identical to those in the arcades, and all character moves seem to be present in those versions, and the game itself runs as smoothly, if not smoother, than it did originally. Children of the Atom was developed by Capcom and published by Acclaim, and it's the first Capcom's game to include licensed X-Men IP characters, both good and bad. And they are in no particular order, Colossus, Cyclops, Iceman, Psylocke, Storm, Wolverine, Omega Red, Silver Samurai, Spiral and even a Sentinel. The bosses are Juggernaut and Magneto. And Street Fighter's Akuma is a hidden unlockable character. All of these have very unique moves, both basic and special, and are very faithful and respective to the source material representations of Marvel characters. X-Men Children of the Atom is really fun and figuring out all the best strategies with each character is really addictive. Especially for the fans of Marvel as big as myself. But it's multiplayer where the game obviously shines and I have to say that if you give it time and master all the characters, the game feels really balanced. If you're approaching it from a get-go with no knowledge of skills and tactics, some may feel better than others. It's easily my favorite DOS vs fighting game of the second half of the 90s. Following the events from a previous game, the seal on the evil wizard Paltivar has been broken and his return to the lands of Yendor is imminent. However, as dire the threat is to become, to have it averted, kingdoms of the land of Tain have to be pacified and brought together, as they are on the brink of the war themselves and can't seem to think of anything else. 
You can form a party of up to 4 characters belonging to 9 available classes, which are divided into non-magic users, clerics and wizards respectively. Skills can be combat based like projectiles, slashing and spellcasting, and non-combat like survival, mapping, repair, fevery and others. And as much as I'd like to tell you more about Yundorian Tales, The Tyrants of Tain, that's all I know. Sadly, I never had a chance to play it and just added it to my for the future list. And all I've told you till now was what I found about it online. It got pretty decent reviews, especially from the gamers, so I decided to include it despite my obvious lack of any real knowledge about it. Hopefully, you'll excuse me for this little shenanigan. This 1997's video concludes the 10 years of PC DOS gaming series. We've covered 10 most important, most active years of DOS gaming and we've went through over 500 amazing games in all genres. It was a hell of a ride and I'm glad that you could be here to enjoy it with me. It's not the end for DOS gaming though on this channel and I'll definitely release more videos covering the subject in the future. Perhaps some obscure little known titles list, maybe some top 10s and maybe just reviews of particular games, good or bad, we'll see. When it comes to those 10 years of series though, I definitely want to plan on giving similar treatment to Commodore 64, PC Windows 1993-2003 and Sega Genesis. So if you like the DOS and Amiga series I've made already, these three may be something you'd want to see too. They're not the only ones I'm considering, but they're the ones I already decided I want to make at some point. If you liked playing those games back in the day, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. And if you still do, click share and comment to help me beat the unforgiving YouTube algorithm. And if you're in a more giving mood, I have a Patreon as well, and all videos land there approximately a day early. Also, I share my progress updates there too, and plans for the future of the channel as well. So if you're into it, it would help me a lot. If you can't or don't want to, don't worry about it, likes and subscribes are good too. For now however, this is all, so have a good one, and I'll see you next time. Peace.